everyone welcome back to my channel my name is katia valino if you are coming across this channel for the first time i'm a nigerian blogger and vlogger that is based in toronto canada if you guys have been following on my blog a couple of days ago um i did her i made her i showed something one of our own when i say one of our own a nigerian canadian went on vacation with family to mexico and he almost lost his life to kidnappers or arm robbers so the story is going viral at the time that i'm talking to you guys right now we are expecting city tv uh television uh from toronto canada to carry this news but i am here with the young man who almost lost his life his name is jason and when he went on a vacation with his mother and the younger brother and he got involved in uh like smugglers with smugglers or kidnappers that he almost lost his life so i am here today talking to him on one-to-one -one on 22nd of february in mexico what city of mexico did that it's, happen uh, playa del carmen what's the name of the resort uh bahia principe Bahia Principe. You said, according to what I, what uh, what was on Facebook, that you went out to see the town of yeah. of uh, what's the name of the city again? Playa del Carmen. Playa del Carmen, yeah. and then you went in the taxi that supposedly or supposed to be an Uber or a taxi, and then what happened? What was your experience in that taxi? Yeah. So. How do you spell your name? B M W E R E. Okay, Jason, walk me through this. What happened in Mexico? A lot happened. Uh, the 22nd at 1 a.m. I got into a taxi. Uh, I had negotiated with the driver that the ride back to my resort would cost 200 pesos. Um, we agreed on that and I walked around the back of the taxi, saw a man sitting in the back on the right hand side for the vehicle. I got into the, the front seat, put my seatbelt on, and I started driving. I had gone to the town that I got on the taxi, that I got in the taxi, like it's Playa del Carmen. So I, we, my family and I had been in the town earlier that afternoon. So I, I, I knew the route back. I had a few landmarks uh, in mind and stuff and um, we're take, so he, he decided to take a couple small roads, like a couple back roads, before getting onto the highway. And I'm saying, um, but he had Principe, which is uh, the name of the resort I was staying at. He said that like two or three times to the guy on the phone. And then he hung up. I was like, that's really weird. And um, we ended up getting on the highway. The taxi was going like 120 kilometers an hour. Like, everybody speaks on those highways. And then... I noticed the car slowing down. Like I could hear it. It was an older, it was like an old Corolla. I could hear the wind cracking through like the door and stuff. So I noticed, I hear the car slowing down a bit. I like looked at him, like I wanted to say something. And before I could say something, I felt two hands put me in a chokehold immediately. Like a tight grip, a chokehold. And both of them started screaming at me, telling me to give them everything they had. Thinking, is this, is this real? Like, or is it, is this a movie? Like. Yeah. By the time I realized that, like, okay, this is actually happening to me, you know, your adrenaline starts kicking in and stuff, and I'm like, okay, do I just give in and what do I fight? Because at this point, I'm like, okay, I'm probably most likely going to get hurt really bad. Um, so I decided to fight, and um, I was I was punching the driver while I was still in the chokehold. I was honking the horn. I was hit, trying to hit the lights in the car on. We're still driving on, the, on, on that highway, but we're probably going hmm. like 80 kilometers. Um, and then I remember the chokehold getting tighter and tighter. And then I, 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 like, I vividly remember hearing myself like lose breath, like, uh, uh, uh. Like, I remember listening to myself and then I passed out. Moments later, I wake up to myself dangling out of the car the sound of the wind hitting my like hitting my hitting my eardrum 
um, I wake up in a frenzy, I realize I'm still strapped to the car. So, like, thinking back on, on, on this, whole, this whole altercation is, I realized that that seatbelt was jammed. Because before I, before I was unconscious the first time, when I was like punching the driver, I tried unlocking the seatbelt, but it wouldn't unlock. And I was like, what's going on? So like, and everything's moving so quick. Like you're just trying to do whatever you can in that moment. So I wake up from the sound of the wind and another fight ensues. I, at, at this point, I, I raise both my legs. This is a small car, I'm 6'5". I'm in a Corolla. Like it was really tight in the front seat. I did like a little crunch, raised my legs, and I started kicking the driver. Like I really started messing him up. Like I, I got, I got, I got some good kicks in there. And partner grabbed the gun, grabbed the gun. I think he said like two or three times. And then I looked over at the guy that put me in the chokehold, and he hesitated. And he's like, no, 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 no. And he said something in Spanish, and I. So we pull over. I'm still hanging outside. I have my left hand on. The back wind, the back window, and my right hand is on the seatbelt that I'm still stuck to. And the fight's going on maybe 10, 15 minutes at this point, like a physical fight. So I'm, I'm laying on the ground, but still strapped to the car. And I remember the, my left cheek was on the ground, and I saw the passenger open his door, go into like a bush pat down on the ground and he grabbed this rock and it was like literally the size of like a volleyball and he just started wailing and my head started swinging mm. and I'm, I'm trying to dodge these these swings and I'm still trying to kick the driver and still trying to like pull myself back into the taxi because I'm because I'm locked in like my range my range of motion is like super super restricted so um he gets me on my cheek, that's how I got my four stitches on my face, and he gets me on my head, that's how I got the nine stitches on my on my head. And that's when like this blow, that's that's the one that made me pass out second time. Woke me up after that was my left leg was still in the car, but my right leg had somehow slipped out of the seatbelt but was trapped under the car. Um my hands were dangling out. And I remember waking up to the feeling of my leg scraping against the asphalt. Like I woke up to myself going, ah, and I heard the engine and I heard it revving up. And like they were trying to speed off, but I was still stuck to the car. So I did like a little sit up. I caught the door again and I was trying to get myself back into the taxi because my leg was still dragging against the ground. And they probably hit like 50 to 60 kilometers an hour. And then the passenger was swinging at my hand so that I would let go. I cared about like that burning sensation that I had in my leg. And um, I couldn't take it and I let go of everything. And I slipped out of the seatbelt. I rolled. While I was rolling, I could see the car speeding off. I heard two doors um, close. Like, I saw a little, I saw like a big dust cloud after the car and I passed out a third time rush of pain just shooting down my whole right leg I got myself up and I tried putting some weight on my right leg and nothing just fully gave up and I knew, I knew my leg was done I remember like this feeling of something really warm like running down half of my face and cars are whizzing by I'm this is pitch black by the way there's, there's no like street lights on the highway it's pitch black and I felt something warm. I, I tapped my skull. I felt a cut. I didn't know how big the cut was. Mind you, I'm, I'm dazed. My jaw's like starting to swell at this point. My tongue was like hanging out. Like I couldn't really talk. And a car was by and its headlights like shine on my hand and my hand was full of blood. I was like, okay, I'm really messed up now. I really don't know where I am. I can't, I can barely walk. I'm bleeding. So I told myself, Jay, just keep moving. <laughs> I, I limped, I limped for like, a, probably like a kilometer or two before seeing a cop car. I didn't know where I was going. I, I just, just started walking. And I saw a cop car, like a cop, uh, I saw cop lights. And I'm walking, I'm walking. On my way to, the, to, to this police post, there's probably like 15 to 20 cars past me. 
I'm like flagging them down. I'm screaming, help, help. I'm there everywhere. Everything was torn. My, my shorts were torn. So like, I see the cop car. I start screaming, help. And there, they lean me against uh, a pickup. The tailgate of the pickup was down. So I sort I wedged myself against it. Because I'm, I'm like, I'm dizzy. I'm like, I just want to sit down. Uh, the first thing they say is, amigo, amigo, what happened? I'm like, one of the cops um, said, uh, did, did they take pesos? Pesos, amigo? They take your pesos? I'm like, what? And then they started searching my pockets for my money. Immediately, like, the first thing that they wanted to do was take my money. They didn't want to help me. I said, I was, I remember, like, I, I, I was in so much pain, I couldn't put, because my hands were cut up and stuff and bruised. I couldn't put my two hands together. They were cupped like this, and I was like, por favor, por favor. And I was pointing at my bracelet, my resort bracelet. It said, but he had principally said which one I stayed at. And I was begging them for them to take me there. I was like, just throw me in the back of the pickup and just drive me there. Um, after patting me down and realizing that I had nothing in my pockets because my rings and my, my cell phone were, were taken by those two guys and they called me an ambulance. I'm begging them for like another 10, 15 minutes. They don't want to release me. They finally give me like a release form to sign, like almost like a waiver saying that, yeah, okay, you, you're consenting to us letting you take another taxi back. But while I was in the ambulance, before I even signed that form, um, I had remembered my room number and they contacted the resort, patched my, my room number, my mom and my brother were waiting and I crawled in the taxi, I wrapped my, I hooked my left arm around his neck and he couldn't see anything that was wrong with me and he's just like, Jay, what happened? My mother and I just remember running and then my, I just hugged her and I just started crying. I felt like relieved. My mom sees me, she starts ripping her clothes and she's crying and she's like, oh my God, did this and she starts seeing the blood and everything my brother's like grabbing lamps and like breaking them and just just mayhem just utter chaos there's a crowd at this point and people are bringing out their phones they're just like whoa what's going on they call they call the police the police don't show up they call the on-site doctor she shows up wraps a few bandages around my knee because my knee was really really bleeding um um, my hip, my hip, I have serious abrasions on my hip. She tried covering those and my right arm. They didn't do anything to my head. Uh, they called an ambulance. <laughs> we get in the ambulance, the, the paramedic can't even start an IV. Luckily, my mom's a registered nurse. She does the IV for me. In the, like, it's just like, everything was just, it was a nightmare, total mm -hmm. nightmare. Mm -hmm. We get to the, we get to the, um, Hospital after like a 45 minute highway drive, they want a $3,000 US deposit before they even see me. They haven't even, they physically haven't even seen me. It's just like, we want your money first. Okay, cool. I, I threw my mom my visa. I'm just like, just charge the card whatever they want to charge it. Like, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to live right now. They sutured me up nice, like, uh, again, you have nine stitches in my head, four in my face. Yeah. How much would that bill cost like the other? Uh, five or six grand US? Yeah. So hopefully I get reimbursed everything. But the resort didn't do jack. They didn't care. Nothing, eh? Nothing. It took them three days to bring me extra pillows. Just to like elevate my leg. Horrible. My mom's an art my mom's a nurse, so my mom is just like the doctor couldn't even dress my wounds properly, like she would dress it herself. They didn't even have the supplies. The pharmacy on, on the on the resort didn't even have like the right bandages to like dress. Like it was just it was horrible. We called, <laughs> we spent a whole day calling pharmacies in Playa del Carmen. They didn't have the bandages. Tulum didn't have the bandages. We called Cancun. The, the right kind of bandage that we needed was in Mexico City. We called Air Canada. Nobody could could accommodate any kind of flight. We called. What was it the embassy or something, Mom? Like consulate. They were just like, yeah, we don't, we don't deal with matters like this. Like totally shut us down. So you, you're pretty much left. We're, on your own. we're stuck. We we're stuck. Like I'm talking open, like open. <laughs> my mom had to freestyle our wound, my my wound. Basically, um, when we ran out of the supplies that we got from the hospital visit, the few that we had, we I would go into the ocean open wound and just like run salt water on it. Extremely painful. Like, but I mean extremely painful, like 
on a scale from one to ten, like fifty. And then my mom would like uh, soak copious amounts of Vaseline on gauze and just like wrap my leg with that vas Vaseline gauze and stuff, just so like um, when it's time to peel it off, they would come off uh, a lot easier. So we were doing. They're just like the first thing they say is that you can't fly. That's the first thing they say. You're not allowed on this flight, sir. They can't let you fly. I'm just like, dude, I I'm leaving. I'm leaving Mexico. Like, there is no way. I don't care. Those three, four hundred people that are behind me waiting in line to get their bags checked, they're gonna have to wait because I'm leaving this place. Like, I just, I just like, I beat death three times, and you're telling me I can't fly out? Like, come on. So, uh, they're just like, yeah, we're gonna have to call Air Canada. Uh, to, to, to see whether we can get cleared and take my mom back to some office. I'm there in a wheelchair holding up my leg for like 30 to 40 minutes, just waiting. They finally get somebody on the phone. He comes back with a cordless phone. He gives it to me. I'm just like, hello. And he's just, and then the guy starts asking me questions. Are you Jason? And he's like, oh, unfortunately, ma'am, uh, all the priority seats are sold. I'm just like, dude, so you just wasted an hour of our time for nothing when like I told you I'm, I'm good to go on this flight. This is with Air Canada? This is with Air, Can this is with Air Canada. We got on the flight, I'm in an aisle, aisle seat um, and my, my I, again I have long legs, well, my, my right leg sticking out of the aisle and people are like hitting their suitcases on my leg. I was, I was, it was too much, I couldn't take it. So I ended up sitting in the middle seat and had my right leg on my mom's lap and because I was in so much pain, I took a Xanax before the flight to knock me out, and that actually helped me a lot. It was like a four to five hour flight. We got back, we took uh, an Uber home to drop off the suitcases, and then my mom drove me in my car to uh, the nearest hospital. And immediately, immediately. Well, actually, we drove to Sunnybrook first. Sunnybrook told us a three hour wait for a doctor. My mom's like, screw that. My mom used to work at Markham Stouffville. So we're at, we're at Bayview and Lawrence, whatever, and we drove all the way to Markham. This is this is probably like 2, 3 a.m. Yeah. of the 27th, okay? And this happened on what day? The accident happened on the 22nd. And we got, we, we, we landed 1.30 a.m. the 27th. Mm. Yeah, so we drove all the way to Markham. On the way to Markham, my mom calls and asks what doctor's on site. Luckily, she knows the doctor. We get there within not even 10 minutes. I'm in a bed. They start the CT scans, like every, like the works. Everything scanned, x-rays, everything. We like, uh, we unwrap everything. She checks my head. Um, and yeah, I got cleared. I got cleared. I'm, I was sleeping most of my, my mom could probably tell you like what the results yeah. of the stuff were, but like I was, I was in and out of, in and out of sleep, still groggy. But thinking back on this whole experience, I mean, what, what goes through your mind knowing that you escaped death, like you said, three times? Yeah, you know, when when I um, when I got up on that highway and like decided to walk, two things like came through my mind. The first, the first thing that came through my mind was, this must be how women feel when they're like taken advantage of or like raped or something like something where like you have literally no control you can't fight and you just have to like just take it and I was like damn this must this must really burn and the second thing is just like okay Jay you gotta live you gotta find a way to live I said just just walk just something something like <laughs> you think <laughs> You don't realize everything that's happened, like like the whole bigger picture of it. Like, oh my God, like I just fought two guys in a in a Corolla, like, and made it out without them shooting me or like chopping me up or something. Like, but I'm not even thinking about it. You're you're literally thinking about like the next step. That's it. You just want to keep moving, you know. Um, yeah, it's 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 a nightmare. Like, like I can't sleep. Like anytime it's dark or something, like. I start hearing myself breathe, like the way I was breathing in that chokehold. Like, it's it's horrible, man. It's I don't I don't I don't wish any, anything like that on anyone. Like, it's the worst experience I've had. I've, I've been to Hawaii, I've been to Cuba, I've been to Dominican, I've been out 
you know, and I've never ever been, you know, confronted like that or mm -hmm. threatened or just um, violated. Like, it's horrible, man. And like, I don't, I don't want, I, I don't have anything bad against Mexican people. Like, I, it's a beautiful place. Like, the weather was perfect. It rained one time, and it was at night. You know, it was just like just a tragic story. Just. Uh, was there any alarms that, that went through your mind when you when you see this tax? I mean, obviously you negotiate the price, but then you yeah. see that there's someone in the back. Did that not? No. So, so the taxi I I, I uh, took down to the to the uh, to Playa del Carmen had two Mexican people in the back, like a man and a woman, and the ride was still was perfect. So, like the the norm was already established for me in my mind. Like I was like, okay, this is normal. On top of that. My family and I took like the local buses down into town that afternoon. So like we took the local buses down and the local buses back. So like it was it was normal like just getting on a ride and paying a certain amount that wasn't like outrageous. It was like okay, this this makes sense, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I, I I don't know I, I you know after like reading because it's it's all over my mom's Facebook and stuff and I'm going the comments and stuff. People just like yeah they look out for people that have like phones in their hand or, or jewelry, like I had really nice rings on. And my iPhone, I have a big iPhone, like the, the 7 Plus, so it's, I was carried in my hand. So I'm like, maybe they, they were targeting me because of that, but I'm just like, that's petty. It's just petty theft. Like you're gonna take a life for a phone? Like, I don't know what to do. So there was no alarm bells that, there was nothing no, that? No, it was, it, was it was normal. Mm -hmm. So I think about like, I think about two things. I'm like, I wonder what would have happened if if I didn't have a seatbelt on or if I sat in the back instead of sitting in the front. And I think it would have been worse. I think that, I think that um, that seatbelt actually saved me. I shouldn't have woken up from that blow to my head. But I think because my leg was dragging so soon from from that actual hit that I gained consciousness, you know, and, and also if I sat in the back, I think he would have pulled the gun first. He wouldn't. There's no way he could have put me in the chokehold. Like his only option would be to, to pick a weapon that can actually overpower me. He was a big guy. He was strong. I remember like I remember his build. I remember the driver's build. I remember the driver's face. Like mm -hmm. I have a really good memory. I have a really strong memory. Like I remember and they were like in their 30s, early 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but I, th yeah, I, th I think, you know, everything happens for a reason. Like, I really believe that. I really believe, like, me surviving this whole <laughs> horror story is, you know, it's like, it's God's plan. Like, it really is God's plan. And what's your takeaway of all of this? If there's anything that you've learned from this experience, what is it? Oh, man. <laughs> learned. I'm jaded now. It's different. Like, I would say, I obviously don't trust, don't trust anyone. But like, it's, it's tough. It's tough. Like, I I will forever feel weird getting into a taxi. Like, just the trauma alone. Like, uh, even even if I'm alone in it. Like, what if they lock the doors on me or something, and then they pull over and some guy opens it. Like. The, it can go any way. It messes you up. It messes you up because you don't really know how to move. You just have to, like, you just have to have faith and, and hope that, you know, like nothing bad happens to you. Or, or just stay on the resort, you know, and just like not explore, not go out at all. Don't go on any excursion. A lot of people were telling me like, how could you be so dumb to get into the test? I'm just like, man, that's normal there. Like, it's normal. Like, people do that. People go off. The resort and go into town, go clubbing and stuff, go shopping and come back and they're okay. You know, I just I just got the short stick, you know, in, in that whole in that whole scenario. So like I'm just glad I'm alive. Like I'm glad I'm alive, I'm glad, you know, like that I can heal from these wounds. I'm not I'm not crippled. Yeah. You know, like it could my leg could have been worse, man. Like it could have been worse. Like letting go I didn't go when I let go was a good idea because my leg would have been done. I probably would have lost my foot 
And you know, you, you you obviously ventured all by yourself that night. You know, do you think it would have been different if you were with a group of friends or with somebody else? Uh, yeah, yeah, most likely. I don't know. I nothing set in stone, but most likely we probably would have gotten a taxi. Well, yeah, we probably would have gotten a taxi that didn't have somebody in it. We probably just got like one of our own taxis, and it was just us two and one driver, and we probably would have gone home safe. If I was with someone, I'd probably go home even later. Because I, I, I didn't even go clubbing then. I just went into town just to see what like what it was, what the nightlife was all about. I literally walked for like 15 minutes through the streets to like the strip and then grabbed that taxi. So like, it could have been even worse. It's my mom's 50th birthday. That's what, like this is the first trip we've ever gone on as a family. First trip ever. And then just to top it off, it's like this whole like, disaster. Would you ever go back to Mexico? No. No. Never. No, you couldn't pay me. Really? You couldn't pay me to go there. No. I'm done. There's there's so many other places to go. So many. Jason, thanks so much. Yeah, I thanks for taking the time to speak. What went through your mind when you saw your son in that state? Heart wrenching. Went to see your son. I'm also a nurse, so I see a lot of blood, so it's not that I. I don't see blood, but when it's yours, it's, it's um, harder to bear. Um, and I actually knew how bad it could be from the size of the lacerations on his, to his head. So my fear was maybe brain damage or so his leg was sprayed. It turns out so. And I just wondered who would do this to Jason. This gentle person is not troublesome. We were just on holidays. Just needed a week to rest. And you know, you, you see him now, and what are your thoughts now, seeing that he's alive and that he's... Yeah, I'm very thankful that he's still with me. And obviously, this whole vacation was for your 50th, you know. Yes. Um, I work most of the time in Nunavut as a nurse, so I'm away a lot, and it's cold up there, so we wanted to go somewhere warm to get there. Then we worked really hard to save money for the trip, and we're looking forward to this trip. And, uh, we really anticipated it. So Three years we planned to go away. We shared a room. We were happy just to be together. That's all I wanted for my birthday, just to be with my kids. I'm just happy he's still here. And thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank At this moment, we just finished the interview. If you are in Toronto this night, 11 p.m., the whole story will be featuring on the television. I'll be leaving a link at the bottom of this video so that you guys can hear the whole story about what happened to Jason. He is my own, our own Nigerian Canadian. Yes, yes. So we have to be there for one another, especially Canada is a beautiful country. So you can imagine after hearing all this news, coming back home and getting medical attention within two hours. Where does that happen? Really, where does that happen? Thank you, Lord. You know, at the end of the day that we are Canadians, doesn't matter any part of the world you are. Just make the most viable flight or whatever to bring you back to Canada. And once you are here, you know that you are in your own God's country so thank you lord this is all i have to say for this time don't forget to follow my blog for all the entire story